And my name is David Germano. I'm the center's director. And just give you a very brief introduction. Professor Feldman Barrett is the University Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Director of the Interdisciplinary Effective Sciences Laboratory at Northeastern University. She has edited five groundbreaking books on the science of emotion, Handbook of Emotions, The Psychological Construction of Emotion, The Mind in Context, Emotion and Consciousness, and The Wisdom and Feeling, as well as over 200 peer-reviewed scientific papers in major journals. She has a long list of prestigious grants and honors, including next year serving as the president of the Association of Psychological Science. She's also been remarkably influential in non-academic circles through her work in such forums as TED Talks, The New York Times, BBC, NPR, NBC, Time, and other such channels. And last year, she brought together these two strands of her life with the publication of a remarkable book, How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. This is a rare book whose depth of scientific insight is matched by the lucidity, eloquence, and accessibility of its expression. It has had an immediate impact, for example, on classrooms across the country, and in fact, has been an influential book for our own academic project here at the University of Virginia on creating the Art and Science of Human Flourishing course for first-year students. And personally, I've found her work to be of transformative importance for its extensive insights into emotions that take seriously the issue of culture, context, interpretation, language, history, and individual difference. Reading her work helps one viscerally envision the real possibility of consiliency between the equally deep but divergent work done in such fields on emotions in biology, medicine, psychology, and the humanities. And so it's with great pleasure today that I welcome Lisa Feldman Barrett to speak with us today. Thank you very much. That was a lovely introduction, David. Thank you so much. Um, those words mean a, a great deal to me uh, because the goal of the enterprise of my lab for the past two decades or more, not that much more, that was a joke, <laughs> um, has really been uh, to try to integrate the understanding of emotion from a number of different theoretical perspectives as a way really of understanding how a brain like ours in a body like ours, surrounded by other brains and bodies, somewhat like ours, um, can create the kinds of human minds that we know to exist. And so in my lab, what we've done is we've used the science of emotion kind of as a flashlight to understand how a brain in the context of other brains and bodies um, create uh, mental life and guide action like the emotions that we experience and perceive in each other every day. Um, and the, the general gist, I would say, of scientific investigations about emotion uh, for the past 50 years or so has largely been uh, what philosophers would call uh, steeped in essentialism. So, from a scientific standpoint, a category of anything, events, objects, um, in people, uh, is a grouping of, of uh, things, events, objects, people, that are similar to each other for some purpose. And essentialism is where we assume that the similarity is in the world rather than in our own heads. So that all instances of a category like sadness, for example, are assumed to share an unchanging feature or set of features, kind of like a causal essence um, that give the instances of this category its unique uh, character. Um, features that create sadness in all instances of sadness or most instances of sadness and that distinguish sadness from other emotions. Now, in the science of emotion, the dominant scientific paradigm, as I said, makes these essentialistic assumptions. For those of you who know something about the, the science of emotion, I'm referring here to the basic emotion approach and certain appraisal approaches. Um, if you're not familiar with that literature, no worries, because we're going to debunk it and move on. <laughs> awesome, you laughed. Okay, so that's good. You're, okay, you're with me. Okay. <laughs> now, I think that... Uh, 
the important thing to say today, or the, the sort of important message that I want to get across, is that the transition in science, in all scientific fields, really begins uh, with essentialist ideas uh, about the nature of the world and then moves to much more kind of contextual, holistic approaches to understanding phenomena. This happened in physics, uh, it happened in chemistry, it happened in biology, and it's, depending on who you ask, currently happening in psychology, or maybe not so much, but maybe for the future. The interesting thing to me is that this is also something that has occurred in contemplative philosophy. Um, and the reason why I know this is because I've been, had the great fortune of uh, spending a lot of time talking to uh, several uh, scholars of contemplative philosophy, including John Donne, who some of you know, um, and Larry Barcelo, who is a cognitive scientist who also um, knows quite a bit about uh, uh, contemplative perspectives as well as um, some of our postdocs and, and graduate students, in particular, Christy Wilson Mendenhall and Paul Condon. And I mention their names because most of what I know and I'm gonna talk to you about today um, really comes from the, their generosity and kindness in, in kind of instructing me. So most of you who uh, know something about contemplative perspectives know more than I do. So I'm gonna, that causes me to feel a little bit anxious uh, giving this talk, but what the hell? Um, uh, but I'll, and I'll just say also by way of, of sort of an introduction that any mistakes that I make are, are um, mine and mine alone. However, I did learn some really interesting things that uh, according to the emails I received from people about Buddhist um, perspectives, uh, it seems like some people actually in the public don't know uh, who are interested in, in contemplative perspectives. And that's the following. that. Um, that I was sort of used to thinking of contemplative perspectives as being quite constructionist and not essentialist. And I think that's true um, when it comes to the notion of an enduring and unchanging self. So the idea that many of you are familiar with, a key idea is that um, we believe that we have some kind of personal essence that makes us who we are and different from others and that this is stable and immutable and unchanging from context to context, uh, from day to day throughout uh, our lives. Um, but, uh, and that um, this belief in a, a fundamental sort of self essence is a distortion that causes us to suffer um, profoundly because we're alienated from the true nature of our own experiences which can be described as a series of dharmas or um, elemental, uh, irreducible um, properties of consciousness. So uh, a dharma is an element of consciousness th that is at the same time physical and mental, and that each dharma contains its own essence um, that makes it what it is. So every time you experience a dharma, uh, it's the same because it has an immutable essence. And so this suggests this is actually the classic, or what I understand to be the traditional uh, view, Abhidharma view, um, that's, tr I guess, termed, John terms it, the traditional um, Buddhist view. So it's interesting to me that this view is constructionist when it comes to the self, that you are not one thing, you are many, th you, are many uh, you have many identities or many uh, selves, uh, but that, you, that your brain constructs depending on the situation, but the dharmas that are the true nature of your experience, that make up the true nature of your experience, are, are essences, have essences, which suggests that there's some essentialism even lurking even in Buddhist uh, philosophy, contemplative philosophy, which I found really interesting. But, um, and this I should say is particularly true when it comes to emotion because out of the 82 dharmas, 52 of which I understand are mental, you will find a list of emotions uh, that are very similar to the Western categories of emotion, anger, sadness, fear, and so on, which scientists have presumed for a long time are universal. Um, but 
even in uh, even in the the sort of contemplative philosophic world, there is also evidence of a transition from essentialism to constructionism, um, uh, with um, a sort of what John Dunn calls a revisionist school. There are many commentators uh, who, who sort of uh, commented on the original Abhidharma view, and um, there are many commentators, but the one who's most notable, at least to John, and therefore who I will discuss today, is uh, 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 an Indian commentator named uh, Dharmakirti. And according to Dharmakirti, the dharmas are actually con constituted by concepts, by human concepts that categorize energy, very basic elements that are somewhat akin to the Western notion of sensation. So what we believe to be essential elements of consciousness are actually our own human perceptions constituted by the human mind. Um, this is very, you know, all, almost all great scientists in physics, uh, including Einstein, make the point that our understanding of the physical world is filtered through uh, our own human concepts. So it's very, very congruent with this view. Um, and that the apparent um, sameness of things in the world or in our own bodies, um, like instances of sadness, um, the things that appear to fall into the same category um, are actually constructed by us by focusing on some properties that are similar to each other that the instances of sadness they have uh, that are similar and ignoring the things that, uh, that, that are distinctive about them. So two instances of sadness may not actually be identical in their physical properties. You might cry in sadness, you might laugh in sadness, uh, you might scream in sadness, you might stay very silent in sadness. Your heart rate could go up, could go down, could stay the same depending on what action your brain is preparing to take. But nonetheless, somehow we have a concept of sadness that um, but binds them together and so that they serve this, these instances serve the same function for us, even if their physical properties are different. And, uh, and in some way, we can um, distinguish them from other categories of other instances of other categories, say, um, anger. In addition, um, the idea is that uh, from a, a Dharma Kirtian perspective, is that the mindful regulation um, in everyday life of experience is not only a matter, therefore, of controlling what you pay attention to. So there's a lot of discussion about, about um, learning to control attention um, in various ways with various um, practices, but as a way of um, uh, regulating experience um, uh, to avoid uh, the fictional um, self, as it were, um, to fo avoid falling into that black hole. Um, but, uh, but in this view, mindful regulation is not only a matter of differential attention um, to properties in the world or in the body, it's also about working with the inferential relationships between concepts. So when you feel wretched with a pounding heart and a sweaty brow, um, you not only uh, are um, able to attend to the sensory elements of the experience, um, but you're also able to deconstruct what it means to be wretched into uh, a pounding heart and a, and a sweaty brow. So the idea here is that um, you're able to see the fact that, or understand the fact that a sweaty brow and a pounding heart could also be categorized in other ways that group uh, amongst other instances to become another emotion like anger or uh, maybe not even an emotion like um, fatigue or um, um, even uh, in certain cases, uh, extreme hunger. And what this does is it allows you to have some 
flexibility or control over the nature of your own experiences because you can bring to, bring to mind different concepts to categorize or give meaning to the sensations in your body in different ways. Another perspective or another aspect of the Dharmakirtian perspective um, is that a concept is generated anew each time it's used. So it's not like uh, you're retrieving a concept whole heart, you know, full on, um, I, that's identical every single time from memory when you are using it. In fact, what your brain is doing, or what your mind is doing, I should say in this case, no, no brains are involved in this discussion yet, um, but your mind is doing is generating a concept each time um, uh, anew. And so the idea here is that um, that it's not just your experience which is constructed. It's not just that your mind is using concepts to give meaning to physical sensations in your body and in the world. It's that the concepts themselves are being constructed on the fly as you need them. In cognitive science, this is called an ad hoc concept. Another aspect of the Dharmakirtian um, perspective is that concepts are, um, have the purpose of guiding action. So information in the sensations from the world and from the body are open to multiple conceptualizations, multiple ways of making meaning. Um, and depending on what your uh, brain's goal is, that is, depending on, or your mind's goal is, depending on um, what action your mind is preparing to take, um, you uh, can conceptualize your sensations very differently. So there is a certain degree of flexibility um, depending on um, the actual action that, um, uh, is, um, that your mind is preparing to, to execute. And, um, and two other very brief aspects um, to this perspective. One is that um, because concepts are rooted in the need for action, that is the action that your own body will take, every concept that you have, every concept that your mind can make, which is in the service of taking some action, um, involves you or some part of you. So if my um, goal is to use this object um, as a, a, a cup to drink from. My concept of a cup involves my drinking, which means that the concept of a cup, even though it's an object in the world, involves some representation also of me as the, um, uh, of the subject who is perceiving the cup. If my goal is to use this as a flower vase to, to hold flowers in, um, then uh, there's a different aspect of my self, my body, that uh, will be uh, represented as part of the um, categorization of this as a vase. And similarly, if I'm to use this as a weapon, uh, that again, my categorization, my conjuring of the concept of weapon um, and my ability to see this as a weapon and use it as a weapon, in, in, again, involves some representation of me. So that there's some blurring of a boundary between what's inside you and what's outside the wor in the world by virtue of the fact that even your concept for object, your perception of object, has a little piece of you in it. Um, we're going to say more about this later, but I'll just say for those of you who are interested in neuroscience and know something about the neuroscience of motor control, um, you will recognize that as a key insight, actually, in the last 10 or 15 years into understanding how uh, motor actions are controlled by the, by the brain. And finally, um, the idea, I think the most interesting idea here um, is that when you change the way that you make meaning of sensations in the world, sights and sounds and smells in the world that come from the world, and uh, the sensations from your own body, 
you have the capacity to change the causal properties of the thing that you are perceiving. Meaning, um, when I see this as, um, when I perceive this as uh, a cup or like, uh, to drink from, or a bottle to drink from, as opposed to a vase to put flowers in, as opposed to a weapon to whack somebody with, um, I'm changing the causal properties of the object in this instance. Now remember, objects are um, uh, not, uh, you know, we sort of are used to thinking about objects as being out there in the world having a static set of causal properties. But here what we're doing is emphasizing one causal property as a cup, one causal property as a vase, one causal property as a weapon. And the idea is that the same thing is also true when you're making meaning of your emotions. So a smile has a causal property to evoke a response in you, depending on how you categorize that smile. It might be, uh, broad, I might be broadcasting happiness. I might be um, uh, welcoming uh, you or inviting you to interact with me more. I might be making fun of you. Right. I might be being differential to you. Depending on how your mind categorizes that smile in the context of what's going on inside your own body and around in the context, um, that smile will have different causal properties. Similarly, an ache in your gut, the same ache in your gut, if it's six o'clock and you haven't had dinner yet, <coughs> might be, uh, your brain might make it into an experience of hunger. If you're in a doctor's office waiting for a test, that exact same ache in your gut could be uh, uh, created, categorized, made meaningful as um, anxiety or dread. And if you are a judge in a courtroom or a juror, that exact same ache in your gut might constitute, be made meaningful as a gut feeling that the defendant before you is guilty and should be punished. All of these examples, by the way, are examples from actual experiments that have been done making the points that I'm, I'm illustrating to you now. So it was really interesting to me um, that these uh, elements in um, the uh, commentary um, on the original uh, Abhidharma sort of views, the, uh, the Dharmakirtian commentary summarized pretty much perfectly um, the work that I've been doing on the nature of emotion for the past 20 years. Um, only more eloquently, <laughs> I would say. So um, I've really spent a long time uh, testing the hypothesis about whether or not um, uh, essentialist views of emotion, these sort of classic, um, the classical view of emotion, that there are, um, you know, a category of emotion like sadness has a distinctive facial expression, a distinctive bodily comportment or um, set of bodily changes inside the body, um, a, a a very specific brain state, and so on and so forth. Um, the assumption is, for, the assumption's been for a very long time, that certain emotion categories, anger, sadness, fear, disgust, happiness, surprise, and sadness, just to name a couple, you know, are essential categories that have essences. Um, and so, if we had more time today, I would walk you through the evidence to, to, to sort of show you that this is really not the case and that um, instead we have to come up with a, a different scientific account and the one that the brain and other, um, well really it's you know information from neuroscience but also from anthropology, from various domains of psychology, um, from um, even signal processing and electrical engineering, anatomy and so on, all lead us to a much more Dharmakirtian constructivist view. But today what I'm going to do is you're just going to have to take my word for it. I'm going to flash a, a, some, uh, isn't that great? Like, just trust me. <laughs> um, 
because we don't have time, and what I really want to try to do is sort of take essentialism off the table really fast, so you, but you can ask me questions about it, and I have whole slides prepared if you want to see the really down and dirty data. Um, because what I want to get to is the neuroscience. I want to get to how the brain, um, what the brain is doing, um, and so that you can judge for yourself just how uh, Dharmakirtian it is. So in my lab, uh, we have studied the question of whether or not emotions really are displayed on the face with expressions that everybody recognizes. So the assumption is, uh, has been in science, and I should say is currently also an assumption in technology uh, companies and so on, that people are supposed to smile when they're happy, they're supposed to frown when they're sad, they're supposed to scowl when they're angry, that everyone around the world is supposed to do this, and that all of us everywhere around the world are supposed to recognize when we see a scowl, it's anger. When we see a smile, it's happiness. When we see um, a frown, it's sadness. That may seem like I'm sort of painting a, a um, straw man for you, but I can assure you with one Google search, you can uh, verify that I am not. Um, there are right now tech companies spending millions and millions of dollars to build um, face reading devices, uh, so much so they trust in this notion that um, they, uh, we, people actually refer to a scowl as an, an anger expression. Um, and so here what I'm showing you are just two papers, two review papers from a, a, a long list of um, actual experiments um, to verify that in fact um, uh, there is, we cannot read, a face doesn't speak for itself when it comes to emotion. Um, there are no facial essences, uh, facial expressions that um, you know, define uh, an emotion uh, as unique and distinct. Um, similarly, uh, it's also been believed, and in fact many um, psychology textbooks state that each emotion category, anger, sadness, fear, and so on, can be distinguished from each other by a physical state of the body. And so here what I've just thrown up is a, meta, a reference to a meta-analysis, which is just a statistical summary of many, many, many studies that was published in my lab, uh, from my lab recently, um, to uh, show that this is really not the case, and that in fact um, your body is highly variable during instances of the same emotion category. Um, and then uh, finally I'm showing here a couple of uh, references to, um, that discuss and sort of d uh, disconfirm the hypothesis that your brain contains an emotion circuit, a dedicated set of neurons uh, for uh, each of those emotion categories, whether it's in a brain region or a brain network or a pattern of activity across the brain. Um, your brain does not contain a circuit for anger or fear or sadness, neither does mine. In fact, no brain on this planet contains a circuit that is devoted to any emotion. So instead what we see is something like this, and I'm going to use the face to illustrate, sort of sum up all of these literatures, but what I'm going to say really applies to any, any kind of physical measurement that we can take about emotion. So when you look at this person's face, how does she look to you? If you were to guess how she's feeling, how is she feeling? Peaceful. Peaceful. Okay, anybody else? Sad, sleepy. People sometimes see her as being in pain. Surprise. There we go. Now we're at, you guys are, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, actually, this is my daughter, Sophia, um, who is, I should say, on her second chocolate drink. Uh, at the Cologne Museum for Chocolate, experiencing what I can only describe to you as a profound, deep sense of pleasure. And this little sweetheart is also experiencing a deep and profound sense of pleasure. So the, the moral here, the lesson here, is that people move their spaces in the same way, I mean, in different ways during instances of the same emotion category. And the same is true of the body, if we measure the body, 
and also of the brain and of the voice and anything physical that we can measure during an emotional event varies within uh, an emotion category. Now, if we just look at this little guy's eyebrow region, it looks like, it looks like actually the, the um, proposed universal expression for anger. And in fact, this guy is often seen as enraged, really angry. Does anybody know who this is? You guys should know who this is. Jim Webb. Okay, I'll just tell you, you're the only audience I've talked to in the last five years who, who knows who this is. This is Jim Webb. And when viewed in context, you can see that he is not angry. In fact, he's elated because with his victory, he is returning the Senate to democratic control. Okay. People, I, you know what? I actually, in, when, I'm in, when I'm in Massachusetts, I usually make a commentary, but I decided I was going to pass on that today. Um, the thing is that people usually see this face when it's viewed without context as communicating anger because this is the stereotype of anger in our culture. So those expressions, you know, smiling um, in happiness and um, scowling in anger and so on are stereotypes. They're stereotypes that belong to our culture that don't exist necessarily in other cultures. So um, the lesson here is that people not only move their faces in different ways during instances of the same category of emotion, they also move their faces in the same way during different categories of emotion. So variation is the norm. In the face, in the body, in the brain, in the voice, in any set of features, objective features, that we can measure during emotional events. This variation is not random, it's situated, it's contextual. And so understanding the nature of emotion requires understanding this contextual variability. Now, um, in a, in an academic talk, what I would do is uh, talk about the fact that, um, that you know, um, in an academic talk, I would talk about the fact that most theories of emotion or, or approaches to emotion allow some variability uh, within a category and some similarity across categories. The issue is just really how much. Even essentialist views of emotion allow for variability. It's just they explain that variability as having nothing to do with emotion. Right, so if you move your face, if you smile in anger, it's because some regulatory process has kind of intervened um, and um, stopped the sort of obligatory um, scowl. Uh, but in my lab, we sort of taken a different approach. And what we did is instead of starting with um, uh, categories folk psychology categories like anger, sadness, fear, and so on that are bequeathed to us from Western uh, uh, mental philosophy that you can trace back to, you know, the time of Plato, um, and then try to locate the physical essences in the brain or in the face or in the body, we started with, well, how does a brain work exactly? And what's its relationship to the body? And given uh, that biology, what kind of emotions can, our, can a human mind make? Um, and how does it make them? And so we came up with a bit of a different set of hypotheses, um, which can be summarized here. Oh, it would be summarized here if I could. Okay. Oh, no, 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 oh, no! <laughs> okay, I've been giving this talk for a really long time, not with the added... Uh, um, not with the added aspects of Buddhism, but I never had that happen, actually, where I just uh, gave you uh, the punchline and ruined uh, an illusion. Uh, yeah, no kidding, right? Um, my computer, uh, I will blame it on my computer. Uh, I've been having a little trouble with it, and it stuck, and I pressed, uh, you know, impatiently several times, and it forwarded to uh, the wrong place. Um, all right. So here's the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that in every waking moment of your life, your brain is using your past experience, which it organizes as concepts, um, to guide your actions and give your sensations meaning. 
and when concepts are constructed with, with um, using past emotional experiences, meaning um, the concepts that your brain is constructing are emotion concepts, then your brain is constructing an instance of emotion. Um, this is a very Dharmakirtian view, but I, it's a view that I um, uh, developed uh, with many collaborators uh, and students without any knowledge of Buddhist philosophy whatsoever. Um, and to give you an intuition of how this works, which uh, may or may not work now because I've ruined the punchline, um, uh, I will show you an image like this. So normally when people look at an image like this, uh, what they see is a bunch of black and white blobs. Um, so billions of neurons are firing in your brain trying to make sense of this uh, image here so that you see something other than black and white blobs. And your brain is searching through a lifetime of past experiences, issuing thousands of guesses at once, weighing probabilities, answering what is this most like? So you're receiving sensory inputs from the screen and your brain is trying to make sense of those sensory inputs. And your brain is asking, what is this most like in my past experience? Not what is this, but what is it most like? What is it most similar to? In psychology, a group of things which are similar for some purpose is a category. And a mental representation of a category is a concept. So what your brain is doing is it's searching through past experiences in order to try to construct a concept to make meaning out of these, uh, out of these blobs, out of this sensory input. Now normally, when I haven't screwed up the delivery of this uh, example, I would ask, how many of you see an object here? And then no one would put their hand up. And then I would say, ah, that's because you're experientially blind, which means you don't, your brain isn't able to make a concept in order to categorize and make meaning of these blobs. So, let me cure you of your experiential blindness by giving you an experience that will let you then make sense of this. But I sort of have given you that experience already. So let me just ask the question, how many of you here see an object? Okay, I'm not even gonna ask you what it is because, uh, all right. So, well, for the rest of you who don't, who don't see an object, you are experientially blind. What does that mean? It means that you are experiencing directly sensations that your brain cannot make meaning from. Um, so for example, when a person is born with cataracts or um, with corneal damage um, and can't see, that person doesn't learn, doesn't have visual experiences, can't learn the visual parts of concepts. And so if that person as an adult were to have an operation to remove the cataracts or to, to, um, to um, transplant a cor corneas to healthy ones, that person would all of a sudden be able to see. But what that person would see is like that. They would see visual noise because they would be experientially blind. They would have no visual knowledge with which to make sense of the incoming sensory input. And so many of us every day are experientially blind to things that we are unfamiliar with. For example, who here has ever listened to the sounds from another language that just sound like sounds because you can't figure out what they mean, right? Yeah, that is experiential blindness. You don't know what the sounds refer to in the world, right? Or who here has a teenage daughter who listens to dubstep? Okay. I was, I can tell you, very experientially blind um, to dubstep until I developed a concept, for better or for worse, uh, developed a concept for it. Actually, when my daughter learned, my daughter's a drummer, she's a heavy metal drummer. I had a willful ignorance of heavy metal music. I would say like a willful experiential blindness to heavy metal music until my daughter became a drummer. And then I actually started to listen to it of my own free will in the car because she was playing drums on a track. 
So that's the power of concept. Um, but okay, so here, uh, now I'm really going to give you, <laughs> I hope, uh, an experience that will cure your experiential blindness. You know, normally, when I do this properly, there's a wave of like, there's a wave of exclamation in the, that you can just hear, across, there we go, that's it, that's the sound, it's very, yeah, exactly. And that sound, I usually make meaning of that sound as, ah, everybody's very, they're having a moment of, of realization, as opposed to, wow, this is a really cheesy example. Um, but now, now how many of you can see a bee? Or at least see part of it, okay. Um, so when your brain is searching now, the, the exact visual input coming from this screen is exactly the same as it was before. But now when your brain searches through its past experience, it finds something new there that it can use to see lines where there are no lines and therefore to see a bee where there actually is no bee. Scientists uh, like me might refer to this as a hallucination, but it's not the kind of hallucination um, that sends you to the hospital out of concern. It's the kind of hallucination that, um, that, that describes just the everyday workings of your brain. Now, we, scientists also have a lot of other names for this. We sometimes call it simulation, or we might call it perceptual inference, because you're inferring or simulating the lines that aren't there. Um, that's how you know that something is important in a science where multiple people discover it and then give it, uh, give it different names. Um, that was a joke. Uh, but um, simulation or um, uh, perceptual inference doesn't have to be visual. It can also be auditory. So, for example, how many of you have ever um, uh, had a song going through your head that you haven't been able to get out of your head? Yeah. So that's an auditory hallucination, basically. And what's super remarkable about this is that in order for you to hear a song going through your head, your brain is changing the firing of its own auditory neuron so that you hear that song. So this is something that human brains do and do all of the time. Our brains can change the firing of their own neurons so that we are prepared to hear something, see something, taste something, feel something. And this is the basis of all of our experience. So just so that, now I'm going to show you some data. And um, you know, now what we're transitioning to in the talk is the more neuroscience part of the talk where I am going to attempt to show you, with a little bit of data, um, the, uh, the, the sum of the evidence that supports what I'm saying. And because I am a neuroscientist, in addition to being a psychologist, it's, I'm required to show you some images of brains. Otherwise, like, I lose my card, my membership card. Um, so uh, hopefully, this won't be too painful. Um, this is a, a, what's called a medial view of the brain. This is the front and that's the back. So you have two hemispheres of your brain and if you were to crack them open like an egg and look at the inside surface of one, that is what you're looking at. So your eyes are here and the back of your head is here. Obviously this is the top and that's the bottom. This is a lateral view of the brain. So if you were looking at a brain, one of the hemispheres on the side, this is what you would see, but I've sliced into it so that you can see this part of the cortex, which is usually hidden um, because two lobes fold over so that this piece is hidden. So I just sliced so that you can see that. And the orange that you're looking at here, the orange blobs and yellow blobs are activation, changes in activity. And so this is an example of um, br a brain that is changing the firing of its own neurons without any uh, relevant sensory input. Um, and uh, oftentimes, uh, another uh, name that we give to that, in addition to simulation or hallucination or perceptual inference, is uh, that we have an internal model, an internal model of the world. Um, and so what subjects are doing here is they're lying stock still in the scanner. They've just heard uh, a scenario described to them that uh, describes um, sights and sounds and smells and so on. Um, and movements, 
and what's interesting is that even though um, uh, subjects are completely lying still in the scanner, what you see here, what I'm illustrating, is an increase in brain activity um, in the motor part, the parts of the motor cortex, um, the parts of the cortex that support more motor action, and also in somatosensory cortex, which represents touch um, and proprioception, that is the movement of your limbs in, uh, in space, even though the person's completely still. And there should be no sensory changes uh, related to touch or movement in space. The person's, people's eyes are closed, but yet you see a huge increase in activity in um, the visual, primary visual cortex, the neurons that are um, coding um, for um, visual input from the retina. You see a huge increase in activity in um, this part of the brain, which is called the posterior insula, uh, which is primary, cor primary uh, sensory cortex for the internal sensations that come from your body, which are called interoceptions, as opposed to exteroceptions in the world. So um, your heart beating, your lungs expanding, you know, all of that is represented here. So people are lying completely still, and they've just heard a scenario, but yet they are simulating, they are running a model of the expected sensory changes that come from um, uh, living that scenario. And most dramatically, you also see an increase in activity in um, parts of the brain stem here. Um, these regions here actually control your body. They control your heart, your cardiovascular system, your breathing, your um, respiratory system. They control what's called your autonomic nervous system. They control your um, metabolism. They control your immune system. So this is a person's lying still. They're not moving. They're not going anywhere. But yet their brain is representing sensory changes uh, in the body um, uh, just, by, just by imagination. That's the power of your brain. Now, to understand how this works and to see how Dharmakirti in this is, um, we have to understand the brain's function from its own perspective. Uh, and uh, so that's what I, I'd like to do now, is sort of take you through a bit of intuition about how a brain works. And um, what I'm going to suggest to you today is that in the last, I would say, 10 years or so, there's been kind of a revolution in neuroscience that understands the brain as uh, a problem solver, solving what uh, are, is called a reverse inference problem, which goes something like this. For your entire life, your brain is entombed in a dark, silent box called the skull. And it has to learn what is going on in the outside world only via scraps of information that it receives through the sensory channels of your body, like your eyes, or your ears, or your nose. So it is receiving the effects of sensory changes in the world, um, but it has to figure out the causes of those sensory changes, because any given input, like a flash of light, or a change in air pressure, could have many different causes. And that's a reverse inference problem. When you're given the effect and you have to guess at the cause, you have to reverse engineer to try to figure out what is the cause. And your brain has to do this because it has to figure out what to do, what to, how to act, how to move its body around to keep you alive and well. Um, so that you can, you know, um, you can enact your most important um, activity, which is to pass your genes on to the next generation. And there's, you know, so the species survives. So, so the tricky bit here that brains are always faced with is um, they receive noisy, kind of incomplete, ambiguous sensory input from the world. And based on those effects of something happening, the brain has to kind of guess what the causes were. And exactly the same thing is true about the body. So every ache, every um, pressure, every, every single thing that you feel in your body 
that come, the sensations that come from your body, your brain has to guess at what the causes are. Because from your brain's perspective, your body is as uh, mysterious as uh, the outside world. So, in just in the way that we talked about earlier, you know, an ache in your gut could be hunger, it could be anxiety, it could be a feeling that someone uh, is not to be trusted. Um, so how does your brain solve this reverse inference problem? Well, it has another source of information um, that we saw illustrated when we looked at the blobby bees, um, and that is it has past experiences that it can um, reconstitute in, it, in its own wiring. So your brain is remembering past experiences that are similar in some way to the present when physical changes in the world and in the body were similar to the present conditions. So this is the way that your brain uses past experience to um, generate a concept. Because remember, your brain's not asking, what is this sensory input? It's asking, what is this like? What is this like from my past experience? It's constructing on the fly a concept, or what we would call um, an ad hoc concept. And so this is the hypothesis, that your brain uses um, past experiences to dynamically create concepts on the fly as they're needed. This, these concepts are reinstated as patterns of uh, activity, of neural activity from past experiences that are similar in some way to the present conditions as a way of making sense of incoming sensory inputs from the world and from the body so that your brain can guess at what it needs to do next. Um, now the one piece of this I would say that's most important from a biological standpoint that is not echoed in Dharmakirtian philosophy is that this is occurring predictively. It's not the case that, um, that your brain sits around with its neurons off, waits to be stimulated by the world, and then asks itself, gee, what, like, what is this like from my past experience? No, that would be metabolically inefficient. Also, it would be just practically implausible and to demonstrate this to you, anyone who know who, who here is like a baseball fan, which I'm required to ask, having been from Boston. <laughs> Anybody? Baseball, soccer, football, any kind of tennis. Okay. So I used to think I know it's like heretical for me to say this, but I'm just going to admit it to you. So don't tell anybody. Um, I'm not a fan of baseball until I started to learn about the brain's predictive capacities. And then I realized something really important, that when a batter steps up to the plate, the batter is not waiting to see where the pitcher throws the ball so that he can lift his bat and swing. If he waited until he consciously saw the ball before he swing, so tries to swing, he would never be able to get the bat in place and swing fast enough. Just motorically, you're, you're just, things don't work that fast physically. It's just actually physically impossible. Instead, what the, the batter's brain is doing is guessing where the ball is going to be in a moment from now. And his brain swings at that uh, spot. So he's making a prediction. And the batter is trying to outwit the, I mean, sorry, the pitcher is trying to outwit the batter so he can't guess. So the whole thing is like a game of wits, which then became very interesting to me. <laughs> and it turns out this is always how things work. It's just metabolically efficient and also motorically requirement, really, for us, the brain to start planning its, uh, its next action by predicting the sensory inputs that are going to come eventually. So for example, as I'm talking to you, it seems to you as if you are um, just listening to what I'm saying and then reacting. But actually, given your long history of learning about which sounds go with which sounds, statistically speaking, with English and what they refer to in the real world, your brain is predicting every single word that comes out of my mouth. And wouldn't it have been surprising to you if I had said some other orifice of my body? 
right. Because sometimes we are surprised. Sometimes we are faced with novel information that we can't predict. But much of the time we are not. And that's because we predict really well. Most, of, most neurotypical brains, at least part of the time, predict really well. And those predictions are concepts. They are concepts. So your brain, in order to anticipate what's going to happen next, it starts with the present, it projects itself forward into the future, and asks, based on thing, how things are right now, what is most likely to happen next based on my past experience of what is similar to this situation? And it starts to prepare those actions and create those experiences in advance of them arriving. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just walk you through this a little bit, just so that you can see what I mean. I used to do this um, you know, in a very kind of metaphorical way, but here what I'm going to do, I'm going to try an experiment, and you could let me know at the end whether this makes any sense. I'm actually going to do it on a real brain, or a description of a real brain. So here is um, that me a medial view. Remember, so you crack the o egg like uh, a brain open like an egg, and you're looking at the inside view of one hemisphere, front, back. And this is a lateral view, lateral view, front, back, and here's the brain, I mean, here's the body. And we'll talk about those colors in a minute from now. But here's the way it works. As your brain projects itself forward in time, the first thing that it's doing is it's changing, it's, it's making a, 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 a command to um, uh, change the internal systems of the body. And it has to do this a little bit in advance of changing um, of the motor actions of moving your body uh, for the following reason. When your brain wants to, for example, stand you up, it has to raise your blood pressure before it stands you up so that uh, uh, the oxygen can get to your head so that you don't faint. Um, if you were to faint, that would be metabolically expensive. Okay, that's sort of a joke, but only sort of. You break, if you fall, you hurt yourself, you know, you have to mend a bone, that's, that's metabolically expensive. So um, what your brain is doing is, the first part of a prediction is it's assembling the instructions to change the internal systems of the body that are necessary to support a motor action. And the interesting thing is that the way the brain is wired, not just our brain, but all brains, is that copies of these commands, these motor commands and also these commands to, to change the internal systems of the body, which sometimes scientists call visceromotor commands, copies of these are sent to all sensory uh, parts of the brain, including um, uh, what I've depicted here is somatosensory cortex, um, which is the uh, primary sensory um, neurons for touch and proprioception, moving your joints in, in space. Um, this is primary interoceptive cortex for the sensations, uh, representing sensations in your body, and primary visual cortex. So we've seen those before. So these are um, the copies, actually. Um, they're called efferent copies, which are the predicted sensory consequences of those actions that your brain is preparing to, to, to make. So these actually change the firing of sensory neurons, just in the same way as we did when we imagined, um, uh, you know, a song going through our heads that we can't get out of our heads, or when you saw lines uh, that weren't there in order to make the beat. These predictions basically are what we mean when we talk about an embodied concept um, in cognitive science. They are candidates that will causally explain incoming sensory inputs from the body and from the world that are going to arrive in a minute from now. Now, when inputs from the body and the world, um, when they uh, come to the primary sensory regions of the brain, so when sen vis visual input comes to the uh, primary visual cortex in the brain, that prediction is already there, already having changed the firing of those neurons, 
And this input either, um, you know, either uh, confirms that prediction or changes it. If your brain is predicting that you're going to see something and uh, you see something, you see exactly what your brain predicted, no new information makes it very far into your brain because your neurons are in your visual cortex are already firing in a way to capture that experience. So basically, the experience is con the, the firing, the prediction is confirmed and that becomes your experience. If, however, there's something different, you, you encounter something different, something you didn't expect, your brain has a choice. It can take in the new information that it didn't expect, which we call prediction error, so that your brain can update its internal model. You then can predict differently in the future. In psychology, we have a super fancy name for that. We call it learning. <laughs> That's what learning is. Or your brain can decide to ignore the prediction error and go with your prediction. That's usually what we mean when we talk about a hallucination. But it happens all the time. In fact, in my house, since I wrote this book, prediction error has become like, uh, it's now a concept that my family can use, right? Um, yeah, and which is very helpful in, you know, a marital uh, discussion, I would just say. Now, the dis what I'm describing to you here is, um, is a, a set of ideas backed up by a tremendous amount of data from at least five or six different literatures, um, some of which are from neuroscience, some of which are from engineering and signal processing, understanding um, uh, how electrical signals, you know, in neurons, for example, work, some from physiology, um, that are collectively called predictive coding or sometimes active inference. Um, I've just uh, made a, a suggestion of a, a couple of papers here. Um, you can go to my academic website or my public website and find references, or you can just email me um, if you're interested in, in learning about um, predictive coding. There's actually a great book that is, um, which isn't up here, um, called The uh, Predictive Mind, which is very uh, helpful and goes through the, um, the um, some of the uh, kind of the highlights of predictive coding. Now, before I finish up today, I just want to go through one more point with you, um, and that is uh, I want to explain to you what, what the blue color is. So this is motor cortex. This is the motor strip that um, helps to plan and orchestrate motor action. The yellow are sensory regions that, you know, uh, represent vision and interoception and somatosensory touch and so on. But I haven't told you what the blue regions are. And so that's what I want to do now. Um, and then we'll open it up for, for questions. Um, and to do that, we're going to just have to take just a slight step into a little more detail in neuroscience and then we'll be done. So here what I'm doing is I want to show you, I want to show you something that, I'm not going to make the same mistake again. Okay, good. All right. So here is a lateral view of the brain. And at this slice, what you see here is a cross section of the brain at this slice. Okay. And what you'll see, you can ignore all the words there. I didn't have time to take them off, my apologies. But you'll see this kind of thin ribbon here, like that. That is the cerebral cortex. That's your cerebral cortex. If you were to lift that, um, that uh, cortex, the cortical sheet, off the rest of the brain and stretch it out like a napkin, you would see that it actually has um, layers that the neurons are arrayed in layers. So that when you look at it in cross section, what you see is a column of neurons in layers. This is important because each part of the brain has its own specific arrangement of neurons in layers. And 
the colors that you see that I showed you before denote different arrangements of, of neurons in those areas of the cortex. Now here I'm just going to switch to a different image um, just to make it easier. Um, what I've done here is I've just, instead of using blue and yellow and red, I'm using um, different colors of gray, different shades of gray, to illustrate to you um, the different organizations that matter for the point that I'm about to make. Um, so the ones in gray, I, don't, I mean, we don't need to go over all the details, although I totally love the details because it's so interesting, but, um, you know, have, uh, have um, sort of the fewest layers and the ones in, in very, very light gray have the most uh, layers. Why is this important? Because there's about 30 years of research uh, in anatomy showing by a woman named Helen Barbas, who's a fantastic uh, neuroanatomist, and others showing that, pers that, pers that predictions, ad hoc concepts, begin in the regions that are dark gray and propagate, cascade out to the regions that are light gray. So the regions that are light gray include primary, uh, the primary uh, sensory regions that we talked about. And when you're learning prediction error, the information flows in the other direction. So this has been confirmed mostly on macaque, 30 years of research on macaque monkeys by looking at um, the structure of the cortex and understanding information flow within that structure. But it also with cats and dogs and so on, mostly monkeys. But here's the really cool thing that hopefully will, will then we'll wrap things up. There's another name for those really dark gray regions and some of these kind of middle gray regions. Does anyone, does anyone want to guess what these are called? They're called, yeah, you want to say it louder? Yeah, these regions are called limbic. Why is that? A sh I, for anyone who knows what, a, what limbic circuitry is, that should be a shocker, and here's why. Um, because limbic regions for centuries were assumed to be the emotional part of the brain, the most reactive part of the brain, the home of your inner beat, right? Highly reactive and in need of control. But we actually know that these regions are actually the source of prediction signals. They are the place along with the hippocampus, where ad hoc concepts originate and then cascade out to the primary, sept, uh, inter the primary uh, sensory uh, uh, regions and motor regions. So these regions aren't the most reactive regions. They're actually driving perception and controlling action in your brain, not, during, not just during an emotion, but for all mental events. From the moment that you are born until the moment that you die, your limbic uh, ensemble is predicting sensory inputs from the world and anticipating how to act on them um, with uh, limbic cortices. Now, the final point that I will make here is that um, that. Limbic cortices belong to, um, a ne belong to a system in the brain that is basically um, in, has been observed in pretty much to be a part of every mental, every category of mental functioning that you can think of. Not just emotion, but thinking, planning, decision, deciding, remembering, perception, um, it, you name it, that somebody has discovered uh, evidence that, um, that those regions are involved. And the, part of the reason why is that these regions, remember, they don't, just, uh, they don't just influence our sensations, they also control our bodies. They literally, they, limbic regions originally were named limbic 
because their connections actually control uh, the autonomic nervous system, the immune system, the endocrine system, and so on and so forth. So this is actually not uh, surprising to physiologists and anatomists who know, and, and also engineers who know, that the core task of a brain is to regulate your, in, what's called your internal milieu, or you know, all of the systems of the internal parts of your body by anticipating the needs of your body and preparing to satisfy them before they arise. So these ideas actually unify the mind in a way that places metabolism and energy regulation, which we call by the fancy name of allostasis, as well as the sensory consequences of that regulation. So whenever your brain is preparing your body to move around, it has to change the internal systems of your body, which has sensory consequences. So when it raises your heart rate, the, in, that information uh, from your increased beating heart uh, has to either confirm the prediction of a racing heart or, or, or correct it, and we call those sensations interception. So that means that uh, basically the internal changes that occur in your body, your brain's representing of those changes, are part of every concept you make, they're part of every thought that you have, they're part of every action that you take, whether you are aware of it or not. And uh, so from, from a biological um, standpoint, this means it doesn't make a lot of sense to, for example, distinguish, try to distinguish cognition and emotion or thoughts and feelings. That's a distinct, because there are, the brain doesn't respect those categories. Those are folk psychology categories. They are folk categories that are precious to people from a Western uh, point of view, but half of the cultures in this world do not make a distinction between thinking and feeling. So if this were a different talk, we might talk about the rational economic person model, or we might talk about um, the you know, rational legal actor uh, upon which our, um, our legal system is based. The idea that um, rationality is completely separate from emotion. You know, you have some kind of inner beast lurking in you and your prodigious uh, cortex is gonna, that is where rationality lives, is gonna you know, regulate uh, your inner beast. It's a complete fiction. It's a powerful fiction, but it's a complete fiction from a biological standpoint. Um, instead, um, w what we learn from understanding how a predictive brain works, not just our brains, but all brains are structured to function predictively because they're metabolically efficient. To, it's metabolically efficient to do it that way. Uh, and if you aren't metabolically efficient, I sh should point out what happens if your brain isn't working in a metabolically efficient way. You get sick and you die. What do you die from? Diabetes, heart disease, depression. Depression is a metabolic illness. Alzheimer's disease is a metabolic illness, right? There are many diseases that have at their basis some issue with efficient metabolic function. So the link between the mind and the body here is not metaphorical. I'm, I don't have to, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but to, to many other audiences, this is like a, an epiphany, right? That we're not meaning this in some metaphorical way. Um, that the, every concept you make, every concept your brain can make has a piece of your body in it, has an implication for your body. The words that I speak to you, if you understand those words, they're having an effect on your body, whether you realize it or not. I can text something to somebody halfway around the world and have an effect on their body, on their breathing, on their uh, heart rate, on their metabolic efficiency, for better or for worse. In fact, you could read something that somebody wrote 3,000 years ago and it can have an effect on your body, right? So the idea that we, just to remind you, um, you know, uh, um, and now we're, now we're wrapping up, to remind you um, 
of the Dharmakirtian ideas, um, the elements of consciousness are um, not uh, dharmas. Dharmas, which would, we would call, uh, in Western science, we would call the full psychology categories, are also constructions. They're constructions of the human mind. Different human minds are wired to be able to make different dharmas, depending on uh, what they've learned in their culture as the basic categories of mental life. There is more than, uh, so uh, the concepts are, uh, your, make, your brain makes them preemptively on the fly in order to categorize. They're sort of like um, anticipatory categorizations of the incoming sensory inputs from the body and from the world that your brain expects. They are um, designed to efficiently regulate action and they always include a piece, some representation of what's going on inside your own body, whether you realize it or not, whether you feel it or not. Oh, that's another piece I didn't really talk about, but um, is, you know, how is it that we feel our bodies? Um, and uh, maybe someone will ask me a question about that uh, in the question and answer period. Um, uh, and it's by this way that we not only regulate our bodies, but we regulate each other's actions and each other's nervous systems, frankly, because uh, of the, the, we change the causal properties of what it means, of what a, a physical signal means, like a smile or, a, or an increase in heart rate, depending on how they're categorized. So to sum up, what I've suggested today is that your brain is predictive in its structure. The predictions, we can think of them as ad hoc concepts. Um, when information from the periphery, from the bo body and from the world, um, make it into the brain, those, um, that information either confirms the prediction or changes uh, the prediction, meaning you've learned something. And once a prediction is sufficiently corrected, we will say that the sensations, the sensory inputs, are categorized so they can be explained, so that you understand what caused them, uh, so that you know what to do about them. Basically, this is, this is the biology of meaning making uh, as it occurs in a, in a human brain, so that your brain knows what something means and, and how to act on it. And so this guides your action and constructs your experience. And when the predictions come from past experiences of emotion that you have learned are emotion, then your brain is making ad hoc emotion concepts. And your brain can make ad hoc emotion concepts that are wide and flexible, that are narrow and precise. It all depends on what your prior learning history is, what, your, what, uh, what prior experiences have been wired into your brain um, uh, for, uh, for future use. And um, this, uh, these predictions, these concepts, basically guide your action and construct your experience. And the temporal dynamics of when things happen encourage us to believe uh, that uh, emotions are causing actions as opposed to the actions are um, actually a, a constitutive part of what it means to make sense of something as emotion. Just like in baseball, it seems like the pitcher, it seems like the batter is waiting to see uh, where the ball is, but in fact that's really not happening. So the punchline is that your brain doesn't encounter um, stuff in the world and then um, figure out what that means and then react with an emotion. Emotions actually are what situations mean in an embodied way. Your emotions are not mere reactions to the world, they're your constructions of your body in the world. Or more precisely, they're constructions um, of what uh, physical sensations in your body mean, in particular, context. Um, so you're categorizing um, things differently, uh, depending on which concepts are brought to bear. Not, right, so, um, you know, on Saturday, uh, when I um, was flying to Richmond, um, I, uh, right before I got off the plane, um, CNN came on, um, 
Fox News came on, a bunch of stations came on, um, uh, and I had a, a moment of overwhelming uh, sadness to learn that people had been shot in a synagogue. And um, not because I have a sadness n n network lurking in my brain somewhere, but because my whole brain reconstructed past instances of sadness that were similar to this situation, similar uh, to what I felt um, uh, and what I did uh, after other mass shootings unfolded while I was in a public place. Um, uh, like the church shooting and, and Newtown shooting of the children in school. Um, so I was in a public place. I was sitting in an airplane seat without the possibility of having a private moment to call a loved one or collect myself. And so my brain was predicting based on past experiences that my chest would constrict and that I would struggle to catch my breath and uh, that my stomach would start to ache and that my eyes would start to fill with tears and that I would struggle uh, to contain and not do a very good job of it. And that's actually what happened. To me, of course, I was not aware of any of these things. I reacted, to me it felt like I was reacting to news and um, reacting with sadness and I struggled to re you know, retain my composure as I am right now, uh, only then I didn't do such a good job. Um, but those predictions, um, uh, are what orchestrated those actions and the meaning that my brain gave to those actions. At other times in my life, as I'm sure has happened to you maybe, I have cried in anger. I have cried in happiness. I have cried in fear. But in that moment, I was crying in sadness. So emotions feel like they happen to us um, it feels like they are, are um, uh, dharmas in the, in the uh, you know, uh, abhidharma sense, that they are elemental, um, that they impinge themselves upon our consciousness and uh, maybe, can, and, and they're sort of um, elemental, can't be reduced uh, in any kind of uh, more fine-grained way. But decades of neuroscience and psychology and uh, anthropology and uh, signal processing and physiology tell us a, a very, very different story. A story that is much closer to the Dharmakirtian story um, that was written in the seventh century, so more than a thousand years before. Uh, it took basically Western science like a thousand years uh, to catch up. And not everything is exactly the same, right? Dharmakirti's view is a much more reactive view. You have a sensation and then you attempt to categorize it with concepts. It's a very kind of linear, um, reactive view. And actually our brains are, are predictive. So to us it feels as if we're reacting to things when in fact most of the time our brains are predicting forward in time. And forward in time can be a second, a moment, you know, or it can be uh, 10 years or 120 years in, uh, forward. Um, uh, now, there are a lot of uh, things that are still not known about predictive brains and how they work. Um, but, uh, but we know enough, I think, at this point from so many different literatures um, that we can be pretty confident that um, even though we don't know everything, we know something. And one thing that we know is that, uh, which again would be no surprise to you here, is that um, there's a, a real confluence um, of... Um, narratives about um, how actions are controlled and how experiences are constructed, uh, both from contemplative approaches and from uh, modern uh, uh, Western um, scientific approaches. Uh, and this is just one example, I think, of how an evolution in contemplative thought parallels an evolution in um, scientific thought. And with that, I will thank you for your patience uh, and uh, thank you for listening. I can see that I've left you a whole five minutes for questions, so <laughs> yes, yeah.
depressing? One human being trying to communicate with another human being, given everything you've said, but we're formulating our own concepts, we're creating our own perceptions based on our past experiences, which can't possibly be anywhere similar to what other people's past experiences have been. You know. Yeah. No, I think of it as, if you'll permit me to maybe disagree with you, I think of it as um, kind of a glass half empty, glass half full kind of thing. Well, you and I have never met each other, ever. But we're speaking words that, we're speaking, we're making sounds that allow us to somewhat approximate uh, communication. I can say a word like red or anger or sadness, and I have a set of features in my mind that I'm thinking of, and when I say those words, you're actually, as your brain predicts those sounds, based on your knowledge of English, your brain conjures some of those features too, and that means we're communicating. Um, you and I have never met each other, but we're both women, we both have light skin, we both grew up in a North American culture, so we do actually have some things in common. Do we have everything in common? No. The woman who I was sitting beside, actually, on the airplane, was watching Fox News. I was watching CNN. All right, um, she's from here. I'm from Massachusetts. She is. A, she's a fundamentalist Christian. I'm Jewish. I'm an atheist, actually, but I'm enough of a Jewish person to have felt the what it meant for uh, people to be shot in a synagogue. But we actually communicated perfectly fine, actually, in that moment. Amidst all the differences in our backgrounds and whatever, we communicated perfectly well. So I think that, actually, there are moments where um, I might uh, have one set of features in my mind when I say a word, and, and you may have another, and that will cause some misunderstanding, and that happens. And if I go to a different culture, uh, my concepts aren't going to work as well there to regulate my behavior or other people's because the meaning systems are somewhat different. And I have to learn what those concepts are. And that's called acculturation. And we know that if I learn well, I will, I will be healthy. And if I don't learn well, um, then my body will be just, my nervous system will be dysregulated um, and I will get sick. And that is what happens to people when they uh, immigrate, particularly uh, when they're immigrating on not of their own free will. So, uh, yes, there, it definitely is depressing aspects of it, but there are also actually pretty remarkable um, aspects of it. And, and there are many, many implications uh, of what this means for how we live our lives, the decisions we make, and also how we interact with each other that I haven't covered here because I've already... Um, bent your ear for an hour and a half, and you probably, you know, you're going to get bored soon, so. Um, but, uh, so I don't know. I don't know that I agree with you. But I do think it means that we have to maybe take a little more care uh, in, in how we communicate, for sure. To go back to your very first point, or not very first, first point, but about this idea of a essential self, true self, and then a false self, both Hinduism and Buddhism believe that it's the false self that makes us suffer. And it seems as though the false self is created by these ad hoc concepts. What would a world look like without these ad hoc concepts? Is it possible? <laughs> You'd be experientially blind to everything around you. So there's a, I mean, but, but, but that, that's good and that has an advantage sometimes and not at other times. So. What does it mean to deconstruct your experience into, not into dharmas, but into sensations? It means that you are cultivating, willfully cultivating experiential blindness. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it isn't. So what I would say is this, that um, I'm not, I don't have enough formal training in contemplative philosophy to say what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. Okay. I, I think that the best position to be in is to know, to be aware that your perceptions of your experience, your perceptions of yourself and the things around you are as if, you have to act as if they are true. Why? Because otherwise you'd be blind. <laughs> You literally, all the, the world would be, to use William James's notion, uh, a buzzing, blooming confusion of sensation. However, in a moment where someone, for example, 
criticizes you or <coughs> judges you in some way, you could cling to your uh, illusory self and suffer, or you could remind yourself that that's just a bunch of neural, a bunch of electrical <coughs> signals in some, a bunch of cells in somebody's head. And it doesn't really have an impact for who you are in this moment. You can construct and deconstruct your experience at will with some effort if you're practiced enough at it. Um, that will not remove all discomfort from your life because, you know, in, sci in the science I do, we make a distinction between discomfort and suffering. Suffering is personal. Discomfort happens because you, you know, bang your ankle or uh, because you uh, uh, are metabolically compromised in some way, right? Um, because you have tissue damage somewhere. Um, the distinction uh, between deconstructing suffering into mere discomfort actually allows some people to become, uh, uh, to no longer be addicted to opiates, for example. So no, I think it's actually very powerful to have that skill. But it is a skill that you have to learn, you have to cultivate um, with, with, with a lot of practice. Hi, I was wondering if you've done research specifically how this impact is related to our implicit biases connected to race. Yeah, so I personally have not, I personally do not do research on, on implicit bias related to ethnicity and race. But, um, but uh, I am aware of that literature. I do work um, that is, often I'm called on by the National Science Foundation and other uh, governing bodies of science to, to judge that research, to review it in some way. And um, yes, so uh, implicit bias um, is a function of uh, your brain um, making predictions uh, and um, not necessarily paying attention to prediction error uh, when uh, it arises. And in the, my book, I talk, I use uh, this as an example in the chapter on um, the law that I talk about the implications of this view, you know, understanding uh, uh, this view of the brain, it's the implications for the law. Um, you know, just in the same way that if, if, uh, if I haven't met you before and you and I are in a conversation, I'm gonna, my brain's gonna make predictions about the meaning of your, it's gonna categorize your, facial movements in a stereotypic way. I'm gonna use a stereotype. A smile is happiness and a scowl is anger. Um, because I don't know you. I don't have a lot of information about you. Um, but eventually, as I get to know you, I will learn something about you, specifically, how you specifically uh, interact in different contexts. So my husband, for example, makes a full facial scowl, like really, like, like, you know, Mr. Anger in uh, Inside Out, when he's concentrating on something. And it took me a real, it took me a really long time, right, to, you know, learn that prediction error, man. I mean, like, a long time. And, uh, and right after I started dating him, uh, and I, I brought this, um, you know, to my lab and said, can you believe it? He makes a full-on facial scowl when he's concentrating. And then I realized, oh my, actually I do that. And my graduate students were like, we thought that you hated every talk that we practiced in the lab. You know, because actually I do. I knit my brow and I kind of, and I, I, when I'm concentrating really hard. Sometimes when I'm concentrating really hard, I ha have a hard time maintaining eye contact with someone because I'm thinking really hard. And I look away to kind of try to think, and then that can lead people to think I'm disinterested, when in fact, actually, I'm just exactly the opposite. So my point is that, um, yes, I mean, that's what you could say. I'm using, people are using stereotypes with each other about what facial movements mean as emotional expressions, but some of us learn the prediction error. And in, um, in uh, implicit bias, what happens is either you haven't had enough exposure to the out group, <laughs> Uh, to, to learn, or that you are, may, for example, metabolically compromised. Like, what are the two most expensive? I'm not reducing everything to me metabolism here, I, you know. But metabolism is a huge 
a causal factor in a lot of what your brain does that it basically goes unexamined in uh, psychological phenomena. So if your, your brain is basically running a budget for your body, and it's not budgeting money, it's budgeting glucose and salt and water and oxygen. Now, when you, in your own life, are running a deficit in your bank account, what do you do? You stop spending, presumably. What does a brain do? It stops spending. What are the two most expensive things that a brain can do? It can move your body around, and it can learn something new, prediction error. Learning is expensive, metabolically speaking. So if you're encumbered in some way, if you are, what it means to be stressed is that your body budget is out of balance. It is running a deficit. What do you do? You, are you in a position to learn new things about people, specifically who are very different from you? The answer is no, you are not. So there's a reason why racism and sexism and every kind of ism goes up. There's a reason why nationalism rises uh, when people are under, under uh, um, you know, constrained, uh, when, when resources are constrained, either, either financially or usually also goes along with metabolically. It's because it's expensive. There's a cost that people can't, literally can't afford. And when you see amygdala activity, we haven't talked very much about the amygdala here, activity when you're faced with someone of a different race than you, it's usually, it's, not, it's nothing to do with fear. The neurons from fear, there are no neurons for fear, but they certainly don't live in the amygdala. Your amygdala basically is like a beacon that signals lots of other parts of the brain, hey, this is important for future body budgeting, for allostasis, learn it. This is uncertain. It might be, it might be threatening, but it might not. But we don't know, so make sure you learn this. It's an alerting, uh, it sends an alerting signal to learn so when you're faced, when you see, if I took any of you and I stuck you in a brain scanner and I showed you a face that you had never seen before, of any color skin, you would show an, a huge amygdala response just because it's a novel person and you might need to know who that person is and so your brain will learn it. So yes, there is an explanation here that uh, can be, there is a, a way of understanding implicit bias um, uh, by, uh, by virtue of understanding predictive brain, there's also a way to reduce implicit bias by virtue of understanding how a, brain, a predictive brain works, which I also talk about in the book. What is your greatest hope for the real world impact that your research might have? Um, It depends on the day when you ask me this question. Um, today, well, um, I guess uh, I would say I would. Well, I always think my my always my first go-to answer here is to. Uh, eradicate childhood poverty, actually. <laughs> because um, uh, little infant brains are not miniature adult brains. They are brains that are waiting for a set of wiring instructions from the world. And they wire themselves to the physical and social realities that they live in. And that wiring is li in limited. Uh, in conditions of poverty or adversity. And so that's one wish that I have. I think another wish is that I, w I would like people to understand, I wish people could understand that they are, um, they are the, the architects of their own experience to some extent and that they have more control, not control in the moment, control in the moment over what you experience is hard but you're, you know, this view has a, suggests that the control of experience is, and action is broader uh, than you might think. The time frame is broader than you might think. You can train your brain 
um, to deconstruct. You can train your brain to construct differently. Just like driving a car, you, can, you, you have to do it. It's a lot of effort, but then eventually becomes automatic. It's the same thing as learning new concepts or expanding your concepts. Um, I would like people to be a little more curious and a little more humble and not be such essentialists. I think every ill that occurs in groups of people living together has to, is related in some way to essentialism. Um, to, to believing that the similarities that you see and the differences that you see are actually out there in the world and that you aren't the author of them. Um, I think it, if, if you are aware that you are the architect of your own experience, it makes you le a little less certain of your view and a little more curious about other people, which I think we could all do with a dose of that right now. And I guess the other thing I would say is I think in general, whether people agree with this view or not, I, what, I, what I hope is that it's communicating something about how science works, how you can have a hypothesis and test it. You can be wrong sometimes. Ideas can come again and again and again from different sources. The diversity of ideas is really important in science. So I, I think I hope that in general that there's an, that part of the enterprise is to teach people something about how science works because you need that to be an active and vibrant and effective citizen in a democracy in the 21st century. And many people don't have the benefit of that knowledge because they haven't been taught. So I guess I have many, I could probably keep going, but um, uh, and I, th I, I guess I just, it's hard to, it's, you know, these days po politics is so much on, on everybody's mind, it's hard for me not to go in that direction. Um, but I do think that there are useful things here that people can use in their everyday life to improve their, to make their lives more meaningful and to suffer less and to tolerate dis discomfort sometimes when it's necessary. And, uh, and I think that actually is happening. Um, at least if the emails that I um, receive are, are correct. So, um, but you know, immediately I'm, I'm always thinking going to the political implications, the implications for humans in, you know, large scale uh, groups, just because it's hard to escape that these days. But that was, thank you for that question. It's a little late in the day for this question, but, um, and I may be speaking as an essentialist here, but when you say we should be the architects of our own experience, sounds to me like there's some concept of will behind that. I mean, how much autonomy do we have? Yeah, so when I say that uh, we can be the architects of our own experience, what I mean is this, that, um, there's no question that you can learn skills that, uh, that at first you have to give some effort to that then become automatized. That's how you learn to drive. That's how you learn to speak. That's how you learn to regulate your body so that you eat at regular times, that you go to the bathroom at regular times. All those things are learned skills. What I'm suggesting is how you make sense of the sensations in your body and the sensations in the world around you is also a learned skill and you can uh, you can learn to make awe, you can learn to make uh, gratitude, you can learn to make compassion, you can learn to make anger that brings, that brings you closer to someone instead of tears you apart. There are many, 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 you can learn to make emotion uh, concepts that you don't even know about that exist in other cultures um, that you will first make with effort and then eventually will become a, a automatized. How does that relate to free will? That's a great question that uh, I don't have the exact uh, time to answer here, but I'll just say this. I agree with you in the sense that in most science and in some philosophy, people conflate um, agency with, um, that is where you, um, uh, 
but the experience of being an agent, the experience of control, the experience of um, effort with free will. And that's a mistake. That's a mistake. Basically, um, your brain runs on probabilities. There's some stochastic, uh, meaning er you know, random error that's injected into the system for, for good reason, actually, from an information theory standpoint. That probably doesn't mean anything to you, but I, I'm trying to figure out how to answer it briefly, and I'm not very, brevity is like not my strong suit. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, pro, so it's all running on probabilities, which makes hard determinism pretty much impossible, I would say, in, in any biological system. That being said, um, you know, some of your brain is devoted to representing content. We don't really know how that happens, but it does. And some of your brain, some neurons in your brain are devoted to regulating the content neurons. That's what we call having a goal. That's what we call volition. That's what we call, right? So if you just look at the motor system, for example, you have a goal. This is what neuroscientists say. You have a goal to move your arm or even reflexes are con actually considered now to be uh, on a continuum of voluntary movement because they're sensitive to context. And they're not, they're not executed exactly the same way in every single context. And that goal is um, cascades down to a set of motor actions that are, are variable, meaning um, bi uh, biologists call this degeneracy. So you can have a goal to move your arm, or you could have a goal to pick up something, right? You have a goal to pick up something. But I could pick this up as a drink. I could pick this up as a vase. I could pick it up as a weapon, right? But how I do that, there isn't one set of motor actions for me to pick up a drink like this. Actually, there are dozens of motor actions, patterns of motor actions that can produce exactly the same from the naked eye, exactly the same movement. So I guess my answer to you is it's perfectly reasonable to have, to be able to um, uh, bias uh, representations in one direction or another um, that in a way that looks like free will um, that actually is not really, uh, that is still constrained by your prior experiences. Meaning there are probably a lot of things that you could do <laughs> with this bottle that I haven't thought of because, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what they are, uh, you know. So um, I don't know that I'm answering your question exactly, but, uh, but I guess um, I'm trying to think of a succinct way to say it. Um, you, goals, your goals come from the same place as they are part of the predictions that you make. Um, so, but everything is probabilistic. Nothing, as far as I know, is deterministic. Not even reflexes are deterministic in any way. And so, technically speaking, there is no free will. But also, we do have a little bit more control uh, than we're not automaton. We're not like uh, we're not robots either. There, there is something in between, and that's where most of uh, neuroscience is lives right now. Yeah. Sure. Last, this is the last question. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. How does pleasure and reward fit into this? So, um, so one thing I didn't talk about very much is how we experience the sensations in our own body. Um, so when you watch television or you look around the world, you, you see with a lot of high dimensional detail. You see a lot of details, right? Um, but even though there's a lot of detail in the the, the changes in your body and the information that's sent uh, to your brain, uh, we don't, we're not aware uh, of most of that. Uh, we're not wired, actually, so that we can feel every ache, every tug, every, uh, ch every sensory change in our body. Because if we were, uh, we would never pay attention to anything outside our own skin, frankly. And anyone who's ever had cramps or a stomach ache of any sort, <laughs> you know, knows what I'm talking about. Um, you know, we are wired, so, so if, if vision and audition and, and, and 
you know, are, are like high definition television, then interoception is more like watching a 1950s black and white television with really bad reception. It's just, we just don't have a lot of detail. And so what evolution has furnished us with is simple feelings like pleasure and discomfort, calmness, um, uh, agitation, um, arousal, sleepiness. Um, these are not experiences. These are, pro these are what we call them affect in science. They're properties of consciousness. They're always with you because your brain is always regulating your body. There are always sensory consequences. You experience them as affect. When they're really intense, your brain will make a motion out of them, but most of the time, uh, they're, you know, they are part of thoughts and perceptions of other people. So when you meet someone, you really like them a lot, and you think, well, that's a really nice person, or you meet someone and you think, well, that person's really interesting, and you have a gut reaction to them. That's affect seeking, basically. That's your affect. So pleasure, um, one form of pleasure is just, uh, you know, a the sensory consequences of a body budget running pretty smoothly, uh, very efficiently. Um, uh, that's not, not all forms of pleasure, but certainly uh, pleasure in, in everyday life is usually something to do with um, metabolic requirements being met in an efficient way. What's reward? Whenever people ask me a question about reward, I want to turn it back to them and say, what do, you, what do you think reward is? Like, what do you think it is? And most people say, well, dopamine. Dopamine is reward. And then I have to tell them, well, dopamine is actually not reward. It's, not, it's a neurotransmitter. It's like a chemical in the brain that is related to, it signals to you when there's something about a reward that you need to learn so that you can better get the reward next time. When it, it allows you to expend effort metabolic effort in order to learn something new to, learn, to get the reward. But what is the reward? The reward is any kind of input to a system that will, um, it's like a deposit into your body budget. So a reward can be water if you're thirsty. A reward could be a sweet drink. A reward could be food. A reward could be, these are all primary rewards. Um, secondary rewards are things like money because Money, little pieces of paper only have value. They only impact your body budget to the extent that, that you can trade them for material goods. So little pieces of paper are rewarding to us uh, because, they ha because we all agree, we've imposed a, a, a meaning, we've categorized that little piece of paper as having value and it's rewarding as a consequence. But um, if we, if, if some of us, removed that agreement, that little piece of paper would no longer have rewarding value because it would just be a little piece of paper. It wouldn't have, you wouldn't be able to trade it for material goods anymore. So anything that's rewarding, reward also I should say doesn't necessarily, doesn't always cause pleasure. Sometimes it just removes the absence of distress that comes from an unbalanced body budget. Um, but, but usually reward is anything which will bring your, um, Bring your nervous system back into balance, which means that you're, you're still burning glucose and burning oxygen and, and, and using water and salt and so on, but you're doing it in an, in an efficient way that um, doesn't, uh, doesn't tax the system. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, yes, exactly. So the way, the way to think about what the brain is doing is it's making economic decisions all the time. Should I spend? What am I going to get in re return? I mean, should I spend? Should I save? Should I, if I spend, when am I, am I going to get a, am I going to get a return on that investment? Am I, when will that return come? Will it be big? Will it be small? I mean, so um, the, every, every concept you make has some information in it about potential reward. Uh, I don't think pleasure in and of itself, um, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I used to think that 
displeasure and, and distress, the affective properties of experience were um, causal. I don't know that they are. I, I, they might just be the way that we that evolution has given us to track our body budgets. Uh, you know, since we can't, I don't have a, you know, a smartwatch that tells me, oh, I'm depleted by X amount of um, dopamine, so I better have a cup of coffee or I'm not gonna be able to stay awake, you know, in an hour from now. Instead, what I'll get is a vague sense of feeling, you know, kind of unpleasant and tired. Um, and uh, that will, you know, I, and then my, my brain, though, will be interpreting those sensations based on the context so that it tells me what to do next. So I, I don't know that pleasure really drives, um, that pleasure sort of steers the brain to construct one kind of concept versus another, but certainly anticipated reward absolutely does. Absolutely, for sure. Okay, so thanks so much, and please join me in expressing our appreciation.